This is the Anarchism and the City talk that was recorded at the 2013 Dublin Anarchist Book Fair. The speaker is Chris Elam, who is the author of Anarchism and the City, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Barcelona. You'll find more audio and video from the Dublin Anarchist Book Fair at www.wsm.ie slash anarchist.bookfair. Hi everyone, um, I'd like to, to welcome you all to the first talk of the Dublin Anarchist Book Fair 2013. Um, uh, Chris Erman uh, will be speaking, and he will be speaking about uh, uh, Barcelona and the narco syndicalism during uh, the Spanish Revolution in 1936. He wrote the book Anarchism in the City. He'll be speaking for 20 minutes, and then we'll have a 40 minute QA. Um, there a lot of people here have been passed around contact sheets and feedback. So at the end, um, if you'd like to just post down some feedback, and then there's a contact form if you want to continue um, to get information about what the WSM is doing and activities that you might be interested in. Okay, thank you, and we'll begin. Good morning. Um, well, I wanted to say thanks to Gregor and to the WSM for inviting me here today, and thanks to you all for coming. Uh, I've got 20 minutes to talk about a subject that I spent just over 20 years working on, so it implies quite a considerable work of distillation on my part. Um, as you all know, Spain was the main centre of the anarchist movement in Europe. It was also the centre of the biggest anarchist revolution in history during 1936-37, the most far-reaching social revolution in history, a revolution that was far more profound than the Russian Revolution in terms of popular participation, popular involvement. I'm not going to speak directly on the Spanish Revolution, but I'm happy to take questions on that afterwards. Uh, well, I'm happy to take questions on any aspect of um, Spain's anarchist history. What you see on the screen is a map of the Spanish Revolution, or where the revolutionary collectives were strongest. And I'm using that simply to draw attention to the two historic heartlands of Spanish anarchism, which are Andalusia in the south and Catalonia in the north. So what you have with the Spanish anarchist movement is something of a north-south divide. In the south, in Andalusia, we have a more exclusively anarchist movement, let's say, that was far more insurrectionary. Um, in the south, basically we're talking about agrarian anarchism, with the ex obvious exception of the towns and cities in the south, um, such as uh, Sevilla, uh, where you have an urban trade union movement, but basically on the land you have a very vicious social context. The landowners cared more about their animals, their bulls, their horses than they did the land workers. Uh, and the land workers lived in absolute misery. And what you have in the South are periodic uprisings, like slave uprisings, which are met with fierce repression. Now I'm going to focus more on the north, but I just want to give you some background on the southern movement. Um, in the north, in Catalonia, you have a much more stable and enduring movement. And at its peak, the Spanish movement had about 1.2 million members. And between two-thirds and three-quarters of these members were in Catalonia, in the north. So there's a huge concentration of the movement in the north. Now, it would be no surprise to you to learn that most historians have described anarchism in negative terms. They tend to identify anarchism exclusively with violence. Um, the movement is portrayed as a kind of minority of bad people who um, somehow spoil things for everyone else and manage to dupe people into following them. Um, this is very much an ongoing thing in, in Spain today where history, people, people talk about historical memory in Spain today, trying to 
heal the wounds of the past through history, but still the anarchists get a very bad press, uh, which should come as no surprise, I guess, in, in recent times. Um, the Spanish anarchist movement has been likened to Al-Qaeda. Um, so there's this constant attempt to link anarchism with um, violence, which is a complete mis misrepresentation of the Spanish anarchist movement, because I would argue for every bomber, um, you've got you know dozens and dozens of educators, um, culture, culture and um, the transmission of ideas were really the most important thing within the, within the Spanish anarchist movement. But um, still you have these myths um, being perpetuated. Um, a classic example is Eric Hobsbawm, to show you how politicized these myths are. Eric Hobsbawm, um, the author of many great works of history, when he wrote about Spain, he wrote, to put it bluntly, absolute rubbish, absolute nonsense. Um, he described Spanish anarchism as a primitive rebellion, famously. Um, and he was very wrong because Spanish anarchism was a very modern rebellion. It was a complex rebellion. Certainly it was popular in the rural south um, where you have a very primitive economy, but it was also very popular, as I said, in the industrial north where you have a complex industrial economy. And on top of that, the anarchists the Spanish anarchists brought in some of the most advanced ideas into Spain. In the 1910s, for instance, the Spanish anarchists were debating things like vegetarianism, birth control, which you know, were very um, revolutionary ideas in Spain at that time. Um, they were also very hostile to things like bullfighting, which is only this century that you've got bans on bullfighting occurring in Spain. So, let's get to the main event, the reasons for the success of anarchism. But the first thing I should say is that what was really popular in Spain wasn't so much anarchism, but anarcho-syndicalism. But I'll use anarchism for short time for the benefit of brevity and for the benefit of the 20 minutes that I've got. But um, we can unpack afterwards in the discussion um, the differences between Spanish anarchism and Spanish anarcho-syndicalism. Um, but the main, the main organization in Spain was the CNT, the Anarcho Syndicalist Trade Union, um, whose uh, flag you see there. Well, those of you who like football may have heard of Barcelona Football Club. The myth surrounding Barcelona Football Club, the slogan of Barcelona Football Club, is that Barca is more than a club. Well, this is just a myth. But what we can say with absolute certainty is that the Barcelona CNT was more than a trade union. Um, the CNT practiced a form of community unionism. It concerned itself with all problems affecting the workers, whether the wages, the cost of living, rents, food prices, all the way across the health issues. So the CNT had a very broad repertoire of activity, uh, as well as organizing industrial strikes, you know, huge strikes that could paralyze Barcelona, um, paralyze entire industries. The CNT also organized rent strikes, uh, strikes against the cost of living. The first, the first general strike in Spain in 1916 um, the first statewide general strike was a general strike against inflation. Uh, so the CNT tried to defend the entire interests of the working class community. It launched health, health campaigns uh, against tuberculosis, which was a big killer in a um, hundred years ago. Uh, it created schools. It, said about bringing culture to the masses at a time when the state education system in Spain didn't really exist. So it played this vital cultural role within society. It created um, a vibrant public, public sphere uh, that consisted of newspapers, magazines, 
and cultural centres and educational centres. And I would argue that all of these activities weren't reformist in any sense. They were framed, they were framed in such a way as to probe the limits of reformism, to, to expose the limitations and the contradictions of democracy and to generate struggle from the smallest possible seeds imaginable. And this was all done in defense of a working class that had very few economic resources. The majority of Spanish workers um, before the Spanish Civil War, before the Spanish Civil War, before the Spanish Revolution, the majority of workers were either poor or very poor. Uh, most struggled to make it from one payday to the next without borrowing money from family, friends, or loan sharks. It's only really in the 1960s that things begin to improve for Spanish workers. Now, one of the, the other big strengths of the CNT is that it was a very inclusive union. It wanted to unite the entire working class. It had the, the syndicalist goal of being the one big union of the Spanish working class. But it didn't want to stop there. It wanted to create a united front of the oppressed and the excluded. Uh, so, for instance, it was very strong on organizing the unemployed. It was very strong on organizing the disorganized. Um, one example would be street traders. The CNT created a union for, for street vendors. Um, and the CNT was always prepared to um, pursue the struggles of the dispossessed through to their logical conclusion. So if you look at the unemployed, um, the CNT was prepared to express their desires uh, to channel their energies and invariably this meant breaking the law in one way or another. Uh, the CNT and, and its activists organized what we know colloquially as proletarian shopping, shop, proletarian shopping sprees. Um, basically the unemployed would go out and requisition foodstuffs um, collective shoplifting um, ventures. So in this sense, the anarchists were, they, they set themselves apart from other groups on the left. Uh, if you compare with the socialists, the socialists had a very narrow view of who could be organized, who could be mobilized. Uh, if you look at the prisons, for instance, um, you generally found a lot of anarchists in jails at this time. Um, this is where the anarchists would finish their education, but they also recruited inside the jails. They didn't make a distinction between social prisoners and what the authorities called common criminals. So there are cases where, you know, inside the jails, anarchists would teach common criminals to read and write, and they would actually recruit within, within the jails. Uh, one of the other big sources of attraction, or one of the other big groups that the uh, Barcelona CNT attracted in particular, was the uh, was were immigrant workers. The the Catalan elite tended to look down on non-Catalan workers. They had a colonial mentality uh, towards them, and it was only really the CNT. The, the CNT was the only group in Catalan society that saw that the immigrants uh, were a worthy group and they were prepared to accept them as they were and they recognized that the immigrants were, were a potent source for rebellion so they gave full expression to their hopes and desires. One of the other big attributes I would say about the CNT was the quality of its activists. Uh, its militants were very, very ingenious. They had great uh, talent for organization, great dynamism, and genuine selflessness, which frequently meant that they put their livelihood, their freedom, 
and even their lives in jeopardy. Uh, the, the list of those who fell in defense of the CNT is a very, very long one. Uh, in the 1920s, the employers started organizing groups of gunmen that intimidated and assassinated um, members of the uh, CNT. I mean, we're basically talking about, talking about murder gangs that had the protection of the authorities, the local police. And then, of course, you've got the bloodbath of Francoism in the, after the Civil War. So the uh, activists were one of the CNT's most potent resources. And what's very significant about this is that invariably the CNT's activists and its leaders were workers. They were working class people. Um, the Spanish anarchist movement was a very proletarian working class movement. It attracted very few intellectuals. You could count them on, on a couple of hands, the intellectuals that uh, were, were drawn to the, to the CNT or the anarchist movement. For the most part, the leaders of the CNT were what I, would, what I call enlightened laborers. They were self-educated workers, uh, and they were workers who were educated within the trade union movement. And this gave them an awful lot of advantages when it came to organizing, because these enlightened laborers could communicate anarchist ideas in ways that other workers found very comprehensible, very understandable. And you know, this was one of their big sort of organizing um, strengths at public meetings, in workplaces, or even at leisure in, in the cafe. And these enlightened laborers, they devoted their lives really to assimilating, to learning new ideas, and to spreading those ideas. And for that reason, they were able to create dreams in the minds of their workmates. If you, there's a very good documentary, a Spanish TV documentary, which someone's very kindly subtitled. Um, you can find it on YouTube. It's got English subtitles now. It's called uh, Living Utopia. And uh, if you want to get a sense of the subculture within the movement, I strongly recommend you have a look at that. And these activists were very, very important for bringing in new blood to, to the trade union movement, to the, to the anarcho-syndicalist movement. Uh, they were an example. They were an example to the young. And they, they ensured that there was this conveyor belt of new, new blood, fresh blood coming into the union. Um, a classic example, or one hour of flag up is this man. Um, this is a guy called Jose Perez. Um, and he was one of the most important anarchist figures in the post-Civil War era. Uh, he, he also became a historian of the CNT. His, um, his work, his history of the CNT and the Spanish Revolution has been translated into English. And he was in, he's typical of these enlightened laborers. He started work at the age of eight in the construction industry, which was a very tough industry in Barcelona at the time. Um, and like many of his generation, uh, he worked hard and he liked to play hard. So as a young man, he would frequently go to um, bars and other places in the um, red light district of Barcelona. Um, and all this changed one day when he had a casual conversation at work with a workmate, um, an activist workmate who was older than him. And this um, workmate started talking to him about the ancient Greeks. And Pirax you know, didn't have a clue who the ancient Greeks were. They generally weren't spoken about much in the bars of Barcelona's red light district. And um, he felt somehow ashamed. And from that point on, he completely transformed his existence. Um, his life was motivated by this quest for knowledge. And yeah, he became one of the most important 
anarchist um, propagandists of his generation. So, again, I come back to this central point that education and culture plays a very key role here in all of this. Um, people talk about the Spanish anarchist movement and um, explosions, but really what the anarchists spoke about themselves was creating what they called cerebral dynamite. Um, Chris, you have two minutes. Okay. I'll just touch on um, one, what I see as being one of the main weaknesses of this movement, but in many ways it was a very masculine movement. Um, the unions, the unions of the CNT, like most labor unions uh, at this time, were overwhelmingly male spaces. Men tended to go to trade union, to, men tended to go to union meetings on their own or with their sons. Uh, their wives tended to stay at home. So at cr critical junctures, the militant potential of women wasn't maximized by the CNT. And if you look at the role of Spanish women in cer certain struggles, like con you know, struggles over in the consumption sphere, rent strikes, um, food, food riots, you know, there's a lot of evidence of uh, female militancy, female mobilization and activism. This often wasn't um, maximized by the CNT. But I would argue, to conclude, that their strengths far outweighed their weaknesses. They created a, an anarchist public sphere, in, particularly in cities like Barcelona. They created what we could call an anarchist public sphere of different organizations, newspapers, unions, cooperatives, cultural centers, and they establish a, a firm presence in society. Um, a vibrant, this was a very vibrant public sphere which generated uh, an, what I claim was a relatively autonomous culture, a culture that guided the union activists, the leadership of the movement, and it was a culture that um, was very influential in society. One, an example of finish with is um, Einstein, the, um, oh, whatever he was, I'm a, I'm a historian, I'm not really much of the sciences. Um, Einstein, um, when he visited Barcelona on one occasion, I was right on he visited Barcelona in the early 1920s, um, everyone was pushing Einstein to uh, make a public appearance and um, you know, make a speech. Uh, about his ideas, his latest ideas, his ideas about the post-war um, settlement and so on. The place where Einstein chose to make his only public intervention when he was in Barcelona was at a CNT trade union centre. He, he said he wouldn't leave Barcelona without taking the opportunity to address the workers of the CNT. So that is a very uh, vivid measure how the CMT established this um, firm and important cultural presence within uh, Catalan society. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, we're just a little bit over time, so I'm just going to take about 35 minutes of questions. So I'm going to take them in steps of three. Um, so would you like to begin?
But uh, I was wondering, could you give any examples of um, the cultural side of uh, CNT in Barcelona, something that, that you've come across that would illustrate well? And then one other thing is I've heard of these ideas, um, uh, our place called the People's Houses. Uh, I, maybe not so much in um, Catalonia, but in other areas, these mm -hmm. were also cultural centers. That the sort of thing. What, what would be involved in those? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I was wondering if the CNT had restrictions on membership based on a position in the workplace. So, for instance, they said it was one big union today. Like, did they have managerial restrictions on managers, or what kinds of restrictions did they have? Mm -hmm. Jenny, you had a question? Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, what struck me about what you said was maybe that the CNT's activity was not so much unique for that period of the workers' movement throughout Europe as its best expression. But what I meant was that, you know, uh, organising across the unemployed, cooperatives, mm -hmm. industry, uh, friendly societies, educational societies, was, was something that was common and spanned uh, a large proportion of the workers' movement. Mm -hmm. um, well, firstly, would you accept that point? Secondly, um, does that mean... I mean, what does that mean for us now, though? I mean, I, it seems to me fixed in that period. It disintegrated, partly as a result of the state taking over a lot of it. Um, where does that leave us today? There are some people around who think we can just start all over again and do it all over again, you know, which seems ridiculous to me. But. Okay. Alright, I'm making notes so I don't um, get the questions. Uh, right, the first question about the cultural activities. Uh, well, you mentioned the people's houses. They, in Spanish, these were the Casas del Pueblo. They were um, the traditional, um, the traditional cent cultural centres that later became more identified with the socialist movement. But the, the socialist movement's cultural centres and the anarchist movement's so cultural centres were fairly similar in terms of their format. I mean, they they would have a library that would be the the key um, that would be the jewel in the crown of these centres. Um, the library, the reading room, and a room where people could debate and um, and so on. Uh, you get certain nuances. I mean, certain anarchist centres they wouldn't serve coffee um, because they saw it as a drug. Um, whereas the socialists tended not to be quite as um, concerned about coffee consumption and, and whatever. But that's a minor thing. Um, the, and to go into what these um, centres consisted of, I mean, they said about providing, and on one level, this links with your question, they said about um, providing, if you like, urban services. So the cultural centres attached to them, there would be sports clubs, um, hiking clubs, um, well, that was one of the big things, hiking and um, excursion, excursions, organised excursions to the countryside. Very important when you consider Barcelona was a filthy city at this time. Um, and it enabled people to get out of the squalor of the city. But also it enabled a chance, I mean there was a lot of police uh, supervision within the city. It enabled, um, it gave people a chance to get out and discuss certain topics freely in large groups. So whenever there's a kind of social activity, there's also a, some kind of pedagogical dimension or a propagandist dimension aimed at generating this cerebral dynamite. So if you have, you know, there are cases of excursions into the countryside of two, three thousand people. You know, we're talking about genuine, and these cultural centers were genuine community centers. Um, again, this kind of overlaps with your point. We're talking about a time when there was no popular leisure. You know, you've got a subsistence working class 
which literally, you know, if they can get to the end of the month without having to borrow money, they've got no money left. So um, there's no real um, commercialized leisure open to these people. So um, the cultural centers provide this. They organize theatre um, productions, and you know, generally speaking, the whole family. These were um, family events, and they become community events. So it's very important in terms of cementing um, this link between the movement and the community. And as I, going back to these mass excursions, there, you know, you can actually address large numbers of people and um, you know, spread a message. So they were um, very, very dynamic and multifaceted. The, um, one of the big things that they did was organizing schools. Um, and I would argue that you know, this is perhaps one of their most important activities. Um, I've got a picture, coincidentally, there, of one of these schools. Um, and you know, this is at a time when there was no state education whatsoever. So in these schools, they provided a general education. Um, but there were two streams of classes. You had day classes for kids because, um, well, those kids that weren't already working. Um, there was no state system. You had a church schools, but they were pretty uh, brutal. Um, there was a very brutal form of discipline, and obviously a lot of parents didn't want to pay, they didn't want to spend money for their kids to go to church schools. So um, these, these schools, which were often funded by the trade unions, were either free or next to free. Um, they had limited places. Uh, at night they ran evening, at night they ran evening classes. They taught a general education, so maths, um, reading, writing, um, foreign languages, which you know was useful for some people if they were thinking of um, thinking of going abroad, where there were more stable economies than the Spanish economy at this time. And then, of course, they had more um, politicized classes, you know, classes in economy. Um, not just talking, they were talking about classes in Marxian and anarchist economics. So, um, yeah, the importance of these schools can't really be overplayed. Does that more or less answer your question? I'm um, glad you first because yours is the, the one that I'm sure I can speak more authoritatively about. Restrictions on membership. Um, the CNT, the CNT didn't have, as far as I'm aware, formal restrictions on who could join um, and who couldn't. And generally, at different times, they had quite. Um, a, in Barcelona, you don't really have a labor aristocracy like you know in the biggest scale that I'm aware of. Well, in Germany and in Britain, you have this labor aristocracy. In Barcelona, it doesn't really exist. Um, and you have small groups of more skilled workers, like um, say piano makers or um, master pastry chefs. Uh, at different times, they they enter the CMT. At different times, there was a an association of foremen. They also entered the CMT, but um, basically um, they, they're not around for long because you know it's clear what the CMT is about. It's about permanent struggle in the workplace, and um, these groups um, aren't necessarily looking for that kind of permanent struggle. So, um, to the best of my knowledge, they they didn't have restrictions. It was. Uh, people might join, but you might be surprised to see them join in the CMT. But on a suck it and see basis, they, they spat the sweet out and moved on to, to something else. Um, it wasn't to their taste. Uh, the, the, in the 1930s, when the CMT goes through a big split, which I would argue was a split, Split that should never really have happened. It was a split between more moderate anarcho syndicalists and more radical anarchists. Um, some people have suggested that there was a kind of skill aspect beyond, behind this uh, split, but ultimately, 
the, the people who break away come back. Um, and those that don't um, did tend to be the most, um, the most skilled. Uh, so it was as if the experience they had away from an anarcho-syndicalist union um, made them made them feel that their interests, their peculiar interests, were more um, better served elsewhere. But generally speaking, I would say what you have, and this is in a way linking with your your question straight point. Um, what's easy for the CNT at this time, you know, before the Civil War, um, before the sixties boom in Spain, is that there's a kind of overarching structure of um, economic oppression, an overarching structure of um, discrimination uh, that makes it very easy for them to attract people. I mean, workers, workers have a common experience of child labor, you know, starting work at a young age, a um, common experience of living in um, badly, badly organized communities, you know, communities without pavements, um, communities without proper roads, um, you know, in some cases you've got places that don't have um, adequate running water. So there's this there's this overarching um, sense of um, discrimination and oppression that um, it's very easy for the CMT on one level, I think it's very easy, you know, there, there are people killing their activists, but um, they their message is one that is very meaningful. You know, it strikes a very strong chord with um, with workers. Is that going to something? Yeah. Um, whether this is unique? No, I would argue. I would. Argue, I mean, I wasn't arguing that it was unique. I was arguing. I was kind of attempting to explain. You know, what what were the building blocks that provided. CMT with its strength. But in a way, if you look at Germany, um, I mean the Spanish anarchist movement was never was, um, was never bureaucratized until the Civil War when you have anarchists in government and basically to to impose that um, popular decision of anarchists during government, the movement exerts bureaucratic control over the base. The leadership um, basically you know checks any sort of attempts to criticize the, um, um, the policy of governmentalism. But you could make a comparison with Germany um, in terms of the German social democratic movement, the kind of services that it provides for people. Um, but you know, the CNT is, because the CNT is attacked by the state, by the local authorities, by the employers, in ways that the German Social Democratic Party wasn't. Um, it's, it, it's never as stable as um, the kind of, if you like, the workers' public sphere that you have in Germany. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, you know, the kind of thing that the CNT does in Spain is unique in terms of its sort of day-to-day -day, um, functioning. Obviously, it's more insurrectionary activities um, you don't see much of that in Germany until after World War I, uh, and then only briefly, and it's not the Social Democrats, like the president. Um, so, the more general point you're making, you know, where does this lead us today? It's, um, I mean, it's way harder, because when the, you know, when you've got people in schools like this, there wasn't a great education, so these people were able to fashion what I would argue was a pretty autonomous um, cultural message. They were able, you know, this, this was undiluted by the state. There was, there was no real state education. Um, it was undiluted by capitalist um, leisure activities. You know, there, there were no um, there were, people just couldn't engage in these kinds of activities. Um, you know, Peratz, for instance, who I mentioned before, he was a big football fan. He was a big fan of Barca. He never went once to see a Barca match because 
um, it was beyond the means. It was Jeff Football in Spain, was basically a middle class leisure pursuit. Workers couldn't indulge in this. So, yeah, when you get to, if you like, after World War II, um, with the growth of the spectacle, with the growth of um, commercialised leisure, um, the creation of things like youth culture, um, you're facing a completely different set of, um, of problems when it comes to organising. Um, problems that um, you know, these people didn't have to worry about. Even in saying that, they, you know, the anarchist youth used to complain that people were too interested in football. But yeah, this is in an age before Satanta and Sky and all these other things. So um, it's, it's, the landscape has changed um, considerably. What I would say is a constant is you know, activists today have to look for those seeds, the, the seeds that can actually be nurtured and that can grow into powerful struggles. Um, and this is one of the things that the CNT activists did back in their time. Uh, and, you know, find those issues that reveal certain vivid um, truths in the comments about contemporary society. I don't know to the extent that goes to satisfying the question. Um, unfortunately, due to the time constraints, we're only able to take another three questions. So, take you, the person back, and you. So, let's start. Okay, I just wondered you mentioned the difference between um, anarchism and anarcho syndicalism. I just wondered, could you talk a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. And also, you think my interest when you mentioned the split in the CNT. Mm -hmm. um, again, yeah, I just wondered if you I think the anarchists in Spain, they don't believe 
what some of these people do with very very few um, very few cultural resources. They um, you know they know how their factories run, they know how their workplaces run, they know how the land works, and they just take it over. Um, it's incredibly audacious. Uh, as far as the split goes, um, in a sense, well, it was a completely un I would argue it was a completely unnecessary and meaningless split because you have the so called radicals who describe themselves as the anarchist purists, and then you have the so called uh, moderates who were basically anarcho syndicalists. And when when the fecal matter hits the fan during the Spanish, during the Spanish Revolution, um, you get people who were so-called radicals joining the government of the Republic, okay? So they completely, these radicals, these purists, completely turn their backs on um, their principles. And, you know, it's true on the other side, there are people on the moderates who also join the government. Um, so when you look back at this with hindsight, yeah, you see that what was really the issues behind it were, were some were very personal, um, some were, was fear. Um, the, the radical anarchists of this group called the FIRE, the FAI, the Iberian Anarchist Federation, um, they, had, they were acutely aware of the fact that anarcho-syndicalist and anarchist movements were on the retreat elsewhere in Europe in the 1920s. So, um, they felt that they had to exert some, like a big brother, they had to um, take some kind of control over the CNT. Not necessarily formal control, but a kind of ideological control. And that upset a lot of more anarcho syndicalist factions. So, um, I would argue that the whole thing, which was a very, very debilitating split, um, which brought no credit really to the CNT, which reduced the power of the CNT. I mean, the, the big attraction of the CNT, in my view, was always its ability to fight against the very, very reactionary bourgeoisie and against the very repressive state. And the fact that it had split itself in two naturally reduced its capacity to fight. So I think it was one of the big tragedies of um, Spain's anarchist history before the Civil War. Um, the Mujeres Libres, um, well, they, in a sense, is a so-called anarcho-feminist organization which was created just before the um, Spanish Revolution. And it was to, it was to um, transcend that deficit that I mentioned before, the fact that, you know, women, although, you know, there were a couple of important women activists within the movement, it was to it was to provide a focal point and to push um, an anarcho feminist agenda. In the end, you know, it becomes bureaucratized during the Civil War when the CNT um, when the CNT goes into government. Um, but um, it was uh, a very important group in terms of um, bringing women into into the, the fore of public life. Um, they organized, they had their own newspaper, they organized a lot of um, activities, um, you know, propaganda activities, cultural activities. Um, it was, you know, an, an important activist organization. But um, in the end, you know, it, um, it succumbs to this trend towards bureaucratization in, in the war. Uh, okay, I'd like to sort of ask a question, unfortunately. I'd like to thank Chris for talking. Um, it's very interesting to talk. Um, there are feedback forms and a contact uh, sheet uh, for people who fill them in, if you just hand them up to the person um, at the exit. And we have three more talks next. Um, one in this room, thinking about sex workers' work, um, which we have an initiator. Um, and then room two, organizing the unorganized.
some practical examples and then the pipes which is next door uh, to Liberty Hall and uh, the art of resistance imagining a new liberty. Okay, thank you.